Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Um, I think we're still waiting for some, some of the people that RSVP'd, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Grace Saba. Um, I'm, I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University and co-lead for MACAN. Uh, my partner, Katie Goldsmith, who's the project manager at Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, or MARCO. She's in attendance today, and uh, we'll take MACAN-related questions at the end of today's webinar, if there are any. Um, a quick reminder. There we go. A quick reminder that we have uh, one more webinar in this series. So mark your calendars for that. It's going to be March 21st, um, so a month from today. It'll be about perspectives from natural resource managers. Um, so keep an eye out for the registration links for that. We also have our first workshop is uh, scheduled for May 9th in Annapolis, Maryland. So save the date for that, and we will send out logistics and registration information as soon as possible. And again, the goal of that workshop is to bring researchers, water resource managers, and stakeholders together to determine data gaps and also high research priorities in the Mid-Atlantic region. So today we have a joint presentation um, titled Perspectives from the Virginia Shellfish Industry. Um, the first pre presenter is A.J. Erskine, the general manager for KCB Oyster in Virginia. He also serves on the Virginia's Aquaculture Advisory Board. AJ received his master's at VIMS studying oyster reproductive biology. The second presenter is David Kuhn, an assistant professor and aquaculture extension specialist in the Department of Food Science and Technology at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. Much of his work aims to directly benefit and improve the aquaculture industry through basic and applied research programs. Current research and outreach activities include aquaculture engineering, water quality, aquatic animal nutrition, and biotechnologies to support aquaculture production. So thank you guys for being here today and for presenting for us. Um, I will remind you that the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the MACAN website once it's fully operational. So we're hoping that'll be in a few months. Um, and then once the presentations are over, we'll have an, a 15 minute Q&A session at the end. So if you have questions, type them into the question box or chat box, whichever one you have in your control panel. So go ahead and type those in. We'll collate them, and we'll do a Q&A at the end. And I think that's it. I'll leave it to AJ to start us off. Okay, thanks, Grace. And I appreciate everybody in attendance. And um, special thank you to the MACAN Steering Committee for the opportunity to present um, today. As Grace said, perspective from Virginia shellfish industry um, alongside David Kuhn. So I'm going to give a few slides of kind of background introductory information um, from an industry perspective, then turn it over um, to Dave for more particular um, data, and then I'll follow back with some perspectives and conclusions from the shellfish industry. Next slide. So in terms of... Uh, industry background as it pertains to the state of Virginia, I thought we should have um, a slide that would explain kind of uh, where we've been and, and um, current production. Uh, shellfish hatcheries uh, in Virginia um, have been well established, particularly in the uh, clam industry, the hard clam industry for decades. They've had um, very productive hatcheries. More recently, um, 2008, 9, 2010, um, we had additional shellfish hatcheries, primarily oyster hatcheries, on the western shore of um, Chesapeake Bay. And they're dynamic in estuarine locations and oceanic locations. And in terms of production, most recent data shows um, hard clam production on the east coast is more than 500 million hard clams planted. And in terms of uh, eastern oyster production, uh, greater than 130 million eastern oysters planted, in addition to 2.5 billion uh, eyed larvae produced all in 2015. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to also recognize that Virginia's public oyster fishery um, continues to increase and expand. Uh, most recently, 2014-15 season data showed over 300,000 bushels harvested. Um, that, that's not an extraordinarily high number, but when you compare it to uh, early 2000s being less than um, 25,000 bushels, uh, it's it's certainly a significant increase. So it would have a, an important impact not only from the culture industry, but also the public oyster fishery that relies on wild production. 
that data in particular is from VMRC and, and VIMS. Next slide. So to get into some of the um, the sampling, um, these hatcheries um, they came in about 2009, 2010. Um, like I said, were primarily uh, oyster hatcheries on the western shore, and um, intermittently experienced uh, hatchery failures. And although you know new to really a hatchery production game, um, it prompted industry to to look at collaboration, funding, and sources that could could determine if there was a cause to some of these intermittent um, failures in the hatchery. Um, so industry took it upon itself to to um, contact state of Virginia specifically at that time our Secretary of Natural Resources and look at what kind of um, funding might be available to jumpstart really general or basic water quality parameters. Um, it was a shotgun approach as we had really no idea what we were um, targeting or what kind of parameters we should be looking at. In addition to several others, um, we looked at pH, temperature, alkalinity, um, and salinity. Next slide. Um, this was initiated uh, in um, 2011 and continued into 2012. So we had um, two full seasons, really, of water quality, general water quality um, monitoring. And that was from um, high salinity hatcheries as well as very low salinity hatcheries and um, moderate salinities as well. And uh, it included um, five to six commercial um, shellfish hatcheries. It was discrete sampling, uh, and again, it was a shotgun approach, but the, the bottom line was after those two years, we really had inconclusive results. The, the results didn't show a trend to spawning success or failure. For example, uh, a low pH that might have been recorded did not necessarily correspond to a spawning failure, and likewise, uh, a higher pH or a more reasonable um, range of pHs did not correspond to a spawning success. What is important with the preliminary work that we did and some of the general water quality monitoring, it set a, a framework or a foundation for an in-depth um, research project and industry recognized that um, clearly the, the discrete measurements and parameters we were looking at was not sufficient and, and thus we, we uh, partnered with Virginia Tech and the University of New Hampshire, uh, much of which uh, Dave will touch on now. So Dave, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, AJ, for the introduction. This is um, <coughs> David Kuhn with Virginia Tech. And the first thing I'm going to do is um, kind of just introduce all the um, primary investigators in this project and part of this program. It's an interdisciplinary program across um, different states and between the public and private industry. So it's a nice public-private partnership. Um, A.J. Erskine, as you already know, um, he just talked in the previous slides. Um, another person that's heavily involved in this project is Karen Hudson. She's at VIMS in Gloucester Point, Virginia. She is excellent at coordinating um, workshops and transferring knowledge from research, the research side to industry. Myself, um, my background is actually um, environmental engineering. I'm in the food science department. Um, Joe Salisbury up at University of New Hampshire. He's an oceanographer, which um, actually is, provides for some ch challenges because as an engineer, I think of, in terms of milligrams per liter, and he thinks in terms of millimoles per liter. <laughs> so when you put together these interdisciplinary teams, sometimes you're really challenged with, with some technical things that you never thought would be challenging. So to have phone conversations about the results is very difficult. We have to go back and forth with emails and, and convert units and everything. Um, Jarrell Scott is the uh, equivalent of Joe Salisbury here at Virginia Tech. He works make primarily with freshwater CO2 systems. His background's in environmental engineering as well. Elizabeth Shadwick is at VIMS, and she is studying ocean acidification around the globe, um, and she is also deploying some sensors in Virginia as well, and I'll talk about that. 
Daniel Taylor is a research associate that works for me in my labs. Um, he's a great resource and a technical guy, um, and just kind of a jack of all trades. Brad Warren at the um, Sustainable Fisheries Partnership was kind of instrumental early on in bringing this issue to our attention on the East Coast, on the West Coast. And he helped us put together the team and, and help us really put together the program that we're talking about today. So the industry participants um, are key in this. Without their participation, this program would not be where it is today. And so it's quite amazing. Um, these guys you know, dedicate a lot of their resources and knowledge and you know, we all came together and began working together, which is great. Um, you, know, you go to some other industries and they compete with each other. Well, these guys decided to work together because they recognized that it was important to work together to address some issues. So for those who are not familiar with how hatcheries work, you essentially have your brood stock, um, then you spawn, you have larval culture, typically you have a nursery and then grow out, which is back out in the ocean. And as part of that flow, you have algal culture. So the primary issue has been larva culture, and that's kind of where we're going to focus you know, a lot of our attention today. If you look at the location of the, of the hatcheries, um, we have you know these, those five um, hatcheries that I just mentioned to you. These are the locations. Um, this one's on the Potomac River. As you can see, it's, it's got um, anthropogenic influences and in farmland. Um, down here is more farmland in this area. This is the Chesapeake Bay, of course. And as you go from these northern sites south, the salinity does increase until you come out into the open ocean here. And on the eastern shore, we have a site on the, on the bay side and then one on the sea side. And then this purple dot here is one of the Chesapeake Bay interpretive buoy systems that Elizabeth Shadwick is working on now. Uh, she deployed a sensor out there and, and is doing some cruises and collecting some very important data as well. <clears throat> so the timeline of this program, you know, AJ talked about this a little bit. In 2012, we, we started talking about a basic water quality program. Um, so at that time, they, they were very limited in what they could do in the labs. And then that expanded in 2014 to what we called an ocean acidification monitoring program, and then it's, which involved this, the installation of one of these light cores. I'll get into that later at one hatchery. And then last year, the, the program expanded where we deployed sensors and light cores at all five hatcheries. <clears throat> and we also changed the name to carbonate chemistry monitoring instead of ocean acidification. And that will become apparent, I think, as I start showing some of the data. So going back to that 2012 timeline, we did the basic water quality. Um, with the state funds, we were able to um, outfit the hatcheries with a wet lab where they could do basic water chemistry, um, discrete sampling. So they can do this whenever they want. It's very simple. Um, it's like making a grilled cheese sandwich with a Gorman grill. Like anyone can learn how to do it. Um, so they, they can now look at alkalinity, ammonia, carbon dioxide, not very accurately. It's a titration method, but they can. Um, the calcium, hardness, the cal and then iron, nitrate, nitrite, orthophosphate, pH, potassium, salinity, and temperature. And we also use some of those funds to look at um, some bacteria, speciation, quantification, looking for pathogens. So we could um, actually quantify how much um, certain vibrios were in the water or in the hatchery. We did some discrete sampling with VOCs and semi-VOCs. We saw some bromoforms occasionally. We saw most of the time we didn't see anything at all, spent a lot of money. Um, and then we also looked at pesticides and herbicides. Uh, the problem with the, those last three, the bacteria, the VOCs, and pesticides, is it's so expensive. And it wasn't a really complete program because it was too spotty the way we were. We only had enough resources to check these things once in a while. So it was helpful, but not super helpful. But we're really pleased that all the hatcheries still have the capability to do all the water chemistry. Um, up here. That, that's a kind of a long-term commitment with those state funds, which is great. And so with these hatcheries, you know, you have the water that comes from the bay. Typically it goes through filtration and then goes to larva culture. Um, so filtration, you have unit processes where you might, um, you know, filter out solids or have some kind of biofiltration with nitrification um, or some kind of disinfection process. So each hatchery is a little bit unique in, in what they employ for technologies there. Um, but when we talk about the water quality monitor program today, we're talking about ambient water samples, not what's inside. Okay, so this is more relevant to what this audience is probably interested in. 
Um, so what we concluded from the basic water quality program is that alkalinity matters, calcium matters, and pH. And the carbon dioxide titration test was not very accurate at all. Um, and the other tests that we did were, you know, inclusive. Um, and if you think about alkalinity, calcium, and pH, um, they're all related to um, this ocean and carbonate chemistry that we're here talking about today. Um, and another interesting thing is if you have something like ammonia in the bay, you know, from all the agriculture, that ammonia um, may go across a biofilter on the way into the building, and when you nit when you <clears throat> You basically oxidize ammonia to nitrate and nitrification, you also consume a lot of alkalinity. And when you consume alkalinity, that's not good for oysters either. So a lot of these water chemistry parameters are really, really interrelated. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about ocean acidification. I'm sure this audience is familiar that, of course, as you increase atmospheric CO2, you, know, you do decrease the pH of water. And if you think about the ambient ocean, you're talking about 325 up to about 400 ppm. Um, so that's kind of the range that's increased over the last 50, 60 years. Um, we can also take those CO2 values and convert that over to a aragonite saturation state. And basically what that means is if anything less than one, calcium carbonate dissolves. And if you think about an oyster and a clam, calcium carbonate is very important. Um, it makes up the shell of the oyster um, or clam. And so if you have an omega value less than 1.6 um, on the west coast, the, the folks out there you know, so anything less than 1.6 is significant stress for the Pacific oysters. So those are some values to keep, kind of keep in mind, the 1.6 is in particular. And if you think about, this is the um, one graphic I took from the internet. I think it's important though. Um, the normal pH, this is kind of what um, a shellfish is doing during larval, the larval stage. It's kind of maintaining this pH. It's putting energy into growth and development. It's responding to stresses. It could be toxins or other water quality parameters. Um, and it's also deposited in the shell, you know, forming it, you know, kind of growing. But under ocean acidification conditions, you see a shift. And this is just kind of a nice visual because it shows that the animal now is trying to maintain its pH, it's responding to a stress, mm -hmm. and then it has mm -hmm. very little energy for growth and development and shelf deposition. So, like I mentioned, in 2014, we deployed one Lycor unit at one of the oyster hatcheries with the lowest salinity. And that's up there on the Potomac River, if you remember that picture. So just to remind you, it's right here. And Joe Salisbury basically developed this, um, this unit here where you basically take the water and equilibrate it with the air, and then you dry the air out, and then you can measure the CO2 in the Lycor. And this is kind of like the state-of-the-art way of doing it. Um, it's expensive, twenty to thirty thousand dollars to get one of these into your hatchery with with um, with personnel support, and bare bones. And so it's expensive, and a lot of hatcheries cannot afford this. Um, and so what we did was deploy this just to see how it would work at one of the hatcheries. And so if we look at some of the data, I'll show you two years of data from all the sensors. We also have. Um, other sensors that go along with the light core, you'll see this data here as well. In 2014, you can see the temperature data. We're basically collecting data every 10 seconds and, and then getting the hourly average and plotting them over the year, which is, um, if you ever use Excel, it's a, it's a labor-intensive process. So we're, we're looking at other ways of doing this, of course. And in 2015, you know, similar kind of trend, nothing too surprising here. Once in a while, you'll see this, this um, you know, data gap and that's just because of an issue with the equipment or it was being undergoing maintenance or we had some kind of connection issue with the internet. Uh, now if we look at the salinity, you can see that 2014 was a pretty low salinity year. Um, you know, the hatchery was between 10 and 12 early on in the season and then was down as low as 6 to 8, which is pretty, pretty low for oysters. Um, full strength seawater is above 30, um, 35 typically, depending on where you're located in the in the U.S. and in 2015 the salinity was much better. So you can see these season to season variation. Maybe there was a little bit difference in the, in the sensor as well, but this kind of data is really important um, for the hatchery and then going into some of this model that we're talking about today. Next we have um, oxygen and you can see from February to May the oxygen levels were very very high and, and nice. 
And as you got into the later summer months, it was um, all over the place and decreased rapidly. This trend was consistent in 2015. Same kind of thing. As you get into the later summer months, a warmer weather, eutrophication, and those kinds of things, the oxygen levels were overall lower. Now if we look at CO2 data, you can see that you know from the same time frame with the oxygen was pretty stable. The CO2 was pretty stable, and then it kind of blows up on you as you get into later months. Um, some of this is real data, and some of this may have been, um, you know, the equipment maybe need to be um, cleaned or something like that and make the equilibrium better. But this data is, is pretty real, and um, we probably just can go through and clean out some of the outliers and we go back and look at some of the data. But the overall point here is you can see how low it was early in the season. As you go out, it really increases significantly. Um, this is the same kind of thing we see in 2015. Um, levels overall were higher. And now if we take that CO2 data and convert it over to carbonate saturation state, you can see that, you know, if you look at 1.6 is right about here, you can see that, you know, this particular hatchery, the, it was consistently below 1.6, you know, over half of the time. And this trend continued into 2015, it's the same kind of data. So, you know, the, the East Coast, you're dealing with a very dynamic environment. Um, and actually, if we zoom in on just a couple weeks, you start seeing these diurnal patterns. Okay, so what that tells to me, what that shows me, is that um, if you think about um, an algae bloom in the Chesapeake Bay, and during the day the algae is going through photosynthesis, they're producing a lot of oxygen, and then during the dark hours, during the night, they're respiring just like you and I, and releasing a lot of CO2. And so this kind of data, so when you zoom in on so this big one-year picture data, when you zoom in on it, you often see these diurnal cycles. Next, I'm going to talk about how we expanded <clears throat> this program to the five sites. <clears throat> so if you look here, the red dots are the light core sites. And so we have the original one here, and then we have another one here down by uh, Gwen Island, and then we have another one on the eastern shore. Each of those light ore sites have also been recently outfitted with a CO2 sensor. And so if you think back to the light core, it's a very complex system. Um, it's expensive, twenty dollars to $30,000. And CO2 sensors, you can buy in the marketplace anywhere from you know, $2,000 to, to $10,000, depending on what you want on that sensor with it. So a CO2 sensor is basically just a probe that goes into the water. And, and, and determine CO2 like that, very much like an um, oxygen probe. Um, and so if you, and then we're also thinking about putting a light core or a sensor here at this site as well with yellow. So here's some of the data side by side. Um, if we look at temperature, you can see that um, the KCB site is the, let me go back actually, I'm going to, I should have color coded these, but um, this one here is blue, so this is KCB. This is red on the next slide, and the, the, the plots that you'll be looking at, and the green one's eastern shore. So blue is the lowest salinity, red's mid salinity, and then the green would be the, the highest salinity. So now if we look at these plots, you can see that the um, temperatures you know, varied a little bit from site to site. And in th these plots, I just took 21 days just to kind of zoom in so you can see kind of these, these patterns and stuff rather than being zoomed out so far. Now if we look at salinity, um, as you already know, the KCB site is the lower salinity site. Um, oyster seed holding would be the mid salinity site. And then there's also Cherry Stone, which is Eastern Shore, which is the highest salinity. And what's interesting there is you have, you have these patterns. Um, at the eastern shore site, which is very different from the uh, from the from the Chesapeake Bay side. Next, if we look at the oxygen data, you can see that um, the oxygen data was was generally better at the higher salinity sites um, compared to the low salinity site. Um, so I'll just give you guys a minute to look at this. Um, you know, again, the lower salinity sites had these these data sets that were just a little more extreme compared to the others. Next we have the PCO2 data. 
And if you look at this, um, you know, we're talking about very high values overall. Um, a lot more high, a lot higher than what we talked about earlier with just ambient ocean water. So even at the best site, you know, you're still, uh, you know, above 500 ppm during this 21-day period. Um, Cherry Stone, the highest salinity site, was kind of in the middle there, and then um, KCV, very, very high numbers compared to everyone else. Again, just an additional stress is being located probably at the lowest salinity site and having other environmental influences on CO2. Next, if we convert that over to omega, um, again, that threshold of 1.6 is, is way up here. And everything's below it during this 21-day period. And I'm pretty sure that during this 21-day period, um, all three hatcheries were successful with, with larval production. And so I think overall, these eastern oysters are a lot more tolerant to these um, carbonate chemistry type stresses compared to their counterpart on the west coast, the Pacific oysters. And it may be related to the families that they use here in the Chesapeake Bay, because um, that's also very important as well. And again, you know, KCB, the lowest salinity site, you know, was probably, you know, an outlier here a little bit um, with, the, with the lowest values compared to everyone else. Now, if we take the EOSense data, the sensor data, and plot it versus LICOR, this is a very limited data set. We've been having trouble um, getting all the equipment to talk to each other. And we have to calibrate the overall numbers on the EOSense. But what this does show us is that we do get a correlation. It's not perfect. But we're going to go back and work with some of the equipment and the voltages and stuff to try to get that cleaned up. But this is an example of a data set that we, we hope we'll get out of this with this kind of trend. Um, so we can say that the light core and the cheap sensors are correlated um, to each other with um, a high R squared value, for example. And you know, a hatchery manager or other stakeholders would be um, maybe able to use a cheap sensor compared to these light core systems for the right kind of settings and the right kind of applications. So what we've done in the past is um, we've had to take the data and plot it over and over again, depending on where you want to be on a timeline. And so if a hatchery said, hey, I want to look at two weeks of data, we literally had to go into the program and you know, recut the cells and realign them and, and plot every time, which is very time consuming. Uh, well, Dr. Scott and, and Dan Taylor have been very helpful in developing websites where we can take the data now, where it's getting transferred on an online system through the web, you know, it's going from each hatchery to a server at UNH, and then it'll come to Virginia Tech, and then we can host it there, and anyone can come to this website, enter a, a date range for any of those sensors, the CO2 type data, and plot it over any kind of range they want. They can zoom in and out very quickly on the timeline and download the data. This may be very, very useful information for other stakeholders in the region. We're also working with Brad Warren um, on this Change in Waters website, where it's going to be more of a, a nationwide kind of story site where we're talking about all the efforts around the country and probably some international as well. Um, we're going to talk about monitoring programs, adaptation strategies, research, industry, and then provide links and, um, you know, we're also going to provide a link to the data feed that I just showed you. So we're hoping to get these websites launched into, um, in March. So especially the data sites, really important that we get up soon so people can start looking at that. And of course, we'll coordinate with, um, with the folks here today and on some of this data as well and data sharing. And so now I'll go back over to um, AJ. Well, let me first acknowledge some funding. Um, State of Virginia, of course, we already mentioned that. Virginia Sea Grant was responsible for funding that first LICOR that we deployed. Um, so it's kind of a nice um, bridge funding to the NOAA Salt and Salt Kennedy um, application that we submitted and got funded. And of course, this is, as we see it, kind of the start of the overall program. We hope to expand this further and help the industry with other issues as well. So. Now I'll turn it over to AJ to wrap it up with some industry perspectives. Okay, thanks Dave. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to highlight in, in what you saw with, with some of Dave's slides, the, um, the data, there's a tremendous amount of data that's being collected at these, these hatcheries and um, there have been intermittent kind of technical difficulties, but uh, 
University of New Hampshire uh, has been extraordinary with um, helping to troubleshoot some of those difficulties and Virginia Tech and, and VIMS as well. Um, so it, it is quite a collaboration and I think a rather unique one. Um, from my perspective, and these are my own thoughts, not necessarily all the hatcheries that participate in the program, but um, carbon A chemistry um, does play at times a significant role um, impacting our hatchery success, whether failures or successes, um, whether or not it's specifically conversion um, from fertilized eggs into D-stage larvae or whether we're talking about, as Dave indicated, larvae culture um, down the road and, and whether or not we see that in the first 24 hours or the first six days. Um, it clearly has, well, it clearly plays a role. Probably more importantly, um, for the estuarine acidification, it's, it's more complicated of a story. It's more difficult to decipher. And that's where we are, I think, at this point, um, after mm, two or three seasons of collecting some of this data. Um, one thing we certainly can say for the lower salinity, as you saw in the data, um, the, the pH and the natural buffer that we have is reduced or compromised. Um, not to say that we can't, um, you know, buffer our water artificially, and, and that certainly is a strategy that I'll touch on in a second, but um, despite the, the lower oxygen and the higher PCO2 levels, um, production does remain, um, you know, relatively high. We, I think a goal, at least my goal, um, is to have more consistent production. So you can realize highly productive times during the season um, and, then, and then times where there is no production. It'd be nice to have, obviously, more consistent production. Next slide. So I think, um, you know, we have, we have basically five steps from my perspective as an industry member um, we'd like to identify what are our water chemistry values that are a normal range. Um, and I think, I think we've begun to come up with some of those values. Um, in fact, when we first started, I thought we had some values um, where less than 500 parts, um, parts per million for PCO2, I thought we were productive and we saw successes. And then above that, we, we saw less consistent production and success. But it really fell apart, um, and in subsequent seasons, that didn't hold at all. Um, so I'd like to have an identification of what our normal parameters may be, and then also what are abnormal um, water chemistry values. Once we I can identify those ranges, um, I think we can look at um, processes that, that cause those periods of abnormal values. And the last two points, um, I think, really is where the rubber meets the road for the industry. Um, our goal, or my goal, I should say, is to correlate um, hatchery production with those normal values or what we say are favorable values. Um, we want to be able to say what's consistent production and, and when we can't anticipate that we might have a problem. Um, and equally as important is to develop strategies for manipulating some of that water um, or artificially buffering our water to improve that production. So that's clearly going to change from hatchery to hatchery and the individual um, operators as well as the environment that they operate in. So it's, it's going to be proprietary. It's going to be specific to those hatcheries. Um, but I do think it's important to have an idea maybe what those ranges of um, opportunities to buffer your water would be. Next slide. So to wrap up with a few acknowledgments, again, um, Virginia Tech and the University of New Hampshire to put together this project um, in collaboration with VIMS as well um, is, is rather unique. And, and I just wanted to um, take a minute to highlight the, the hatcheries in addition to ours, um, Cherry Stone Aqua Farm, J.C. Walker Brothers, Oyster Seed Holdings, and Ward Oyster Company. Um, it's been several years now, um, going on six or seven years, I guess, when we came to the table as an industry and, and said, you know, we recognize that um, at certain times, um, you know, we have these these failures in the hatchery, and it kind of behooves all of us to come together and put our heads together as to, you know, why we might see these um, these issues. And as Dave highlighted before, it's it's a rare occurrence um, that potentially competitors um, in a in a hatchery environment like this would come together. But um, it's been a unique experience and certainly um, positive, I think, for everybody. So with that, um, we'll turn it back over to Katie if there are any questions. 
Thanks, AJ and David. That was that was really informative and great. Thank you so much. Um, so this is Katie Goldsmith speaking now, and I'm going to collate some of the questions we've had come in. And uh, as a reminder, if you have a question, put it into the questions box, and I will uh, present it to David and AJ. So we'll start with um, a question. Has anyone done any model modeling to project back and determine what saturation, saturation states might have been happening in the Chesapeake Bay in the pre-industrial period? I'll, I'll try to field that question. I think that would be a great question for folks like Elizabeth Shadwick at BIMS. I think that's the kind of question that she's really interested in addressing. Um, so I don't have an answer today, but... Um, I think she would be a great person to talk to about that. AJ, do you have any comments to add to that? Uh, no, I agree with that. I think Elizabeth demonstrated that she has an interest in that. And, and moving forward, she is part of the team. So I think I think we might be able to address some of that. And I think Elizabeth is on today. So Elizabeth, if you wanted to um, send anything through the chat box, I, I can try to answer that question there. And otherwise, I can just connect you with the person asking the question. So the next one we have here is much of the Chesapeake Bay experiences omega aragonite uh, less than 1.6 naturally, but oysters still spawn and grow. The 1.6 value may be informative for Pacific oysters, but clearly not for Eastern oysters. So specific uh, species specific impacts should be considered the norm. And that said, the data being collected is important. So it looks like more of a comment there, uh, less of a question, but good, interesting info nonetheless. Um, and Katie, this Katie, this is AJ. I just had a quick comment on that. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, you know, I, Dave was speaking to um, you know Jigas and in the, the way some of the some of the data and the results have indicated 1.6 um, out there. I, I've seen, and and again, I'm not sure this is um, ground truth in any way, but what we've seen for three seasons, going on our third season, I guess now with the Lycor system is above one. Um, we generally find that's a good aragonite saturation. Um, that doesn't hold true, like I said, all the time. We It's a little bit more consistent early in the season, say January through April. Um, and as you get into the warmer uh, months, it kind of falls apart. But having said that, we have had production success less than one. Um, but it seems like one is a, is a cutoff, at least for us in the hatchery. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and after that point that AJ just made, I think that um, there's an opportunity for researchers to, you know, set up some controlled studies and, and get at some of that information for the eastern oyster. So I think there's an opportunity for someone out there to do that very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is, where is the shellfish data available? What website? Is it possible that the data may be made available through Maracuse or similar if it isn't currently available? Okay, so what we're going to do is launch the data through our websites first and then start coordinating with Maracuse and Macan and whoever else that wants to access the data. We'll make it open source to those folks as well. Great. So hopefully hopefully by the end of March we'll be, we'll be rolling with live data sets. Uh, this sounds like a question a little bit more for AJ maybe. It says, how long have the hatcheries been around? Um, the participating hatcheries that we have, the five hatcheries, um, the, the the hard clam hatcheries on the eastern shore have been around for decades. Um, those are the ones that are located on the lower bay side, eastern shore of Virginia, and then on the seaside, um, eastern shore of Virginia. The other hatcheries um, that are located on the on the bay side, us in particular, and Oyster Seed Holdings, um, for about six years, and then Ward Oyster Company has been around for. Uh, a number of years as well, back to the early 2000s or late 90s. Okay, um, let's see. This was a, a question that you touched on a little bit at the end there with your funding slide, but uh, the question asks what the future outlook for funding might be and um, how much is funded by the industry versus state better or federal funding. Okay, very good question. I don't, I don't think anyone knows <laughs> what funding is going to look like in the next few years. Um, hopefully, <laughs> some of this, the funding streams will remain. Um, I think on the climate change issue, for example, it's, it's probably good to use language like carbonate chemistry um, the next few years anyways. 
Um, as far as the private side, um, we have never quantified how much resources they put into this, but that's a good question for the industry, and we probably should quantify that for NOAA SK. I think they'd be interested in seeing that because they spend a lot of time, um, it's, it's spend a lot of resources on these projects in terms of personnel, energy costs, um, all sorts of things. And so the investment from the industry side is significant, but we have not quantified it yet. Okay, and I uh, just received a response from Elizabeth Shadwick here, so I'm jumping back up to that question about modeling pre-industrial Chesapeake Bay. And Elizabeth says, <clears throat> uh, Mary Friedrichs, apologies if I pronounced that incorrectly, and I are working both with a biogeochemical model and the historical water quality data to look at long-term trends, predictions, and short-term forecasts. I'm looking forward to becoming more involved with the analysis of the data that has been collected as part of Dave's work. So sounds like much more to come there, which is great. Uh, let's see, uh, another question, were there any abnormalities observed in the data with oyster seed holding site and the painting on the Piankatank bridge? Hope I didn't destroy that. Um, um I'm not sure how to answer AJ, that one. I, um, I, you didn't butcher the name, it is Piankatank, um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't speak for oyster seed holdings. Um, I think they had some, um, some idea that the, the painting that was taken or the sandblasting or painting that was taking place at the bridge at a specific time, um, impacted production and VIMS was involved with a number of studies that took place, um, lab experiments, uh, as well as sampling the water, um, sam sampling the larvae out of the hatchery <clears throat> to my knowledge, it was inconclusive. So um, I think the jury, in, in some respect, is still out on whether or not that was a direct causative factor. Okay. Let's see. It sounds like hatchery production did not correlate with seawater chemistry, but did other traits of the larvae correlate, like growth rate or food intake? I think we saw some correlations with some of the symptoms. And so what we're trying to do with the program now is get better about um, how we quantify um, successes at the hatchery with the symptoms. And so, for example, if a, if a larva has consumed some algae but it's not digested in the gut of the, of the animal, that's probably an indication that there's not enzymes to, to break down those algae cells and it may be a toxin that's um, causing that stress on the animal. Meanwhile, if it's an ocean acidification type um, stress, we would look for shell development and other kinds of things. And so I think we're, you know, we're really trying to get better about how we correlate this water quality with successes. But it's very difficult to do because each hatchery has um, unique filtration and, 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 and production techniques. So it's, it's a complicated process. Okay. This, uh, let's see, the next question seems a bit simple. Where is the data being collected? At the hatcheries. Okay, and do the cultured algae added to larva culture affect the pH of tank water independent of the source water? I think in some instances it has. Maybe AJ, you can speak about your facility in particular. Um, yeah, I think we, I think we've certainly seen that, and and um, what we do is tightly monitor um, the amount of algae that we're putting into those tanks. Um, so essentially, uh, we like to have larvae that are sufficiently fed, but not overfed. Um, otherwise, you will drop the pH. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, questions are coming in fast. Just trying to make sure I'm not missing anyone. Let's see. Uh, we have a, a follow-up question. Um, does AJ or Dave or anyone else have any suggestions on how to protect public funding for this monitoring effort beyond careful messaging? 
e.g. would advocacy with certain state representatives be helpful? And if so, do you know who? Um, I think advocacy is always, you know, certainly important. Um, you know, I think there are some some funding opportunities out there, and um, we've been successful in, in, you know, continuing this effort, and I think we'll be con uh, continue to be successful as far as a, in particular, a point person. Um, I, I'm not sure if I I don't know of one. Maybe Dave does. Dave, did you want to comment on that or? Oh, sorry, I was muted. I was commenting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it is important for, um, you know, to, to talk to your local representatives um, and start there and see where you can go. I think it's important for them to hear these voices at the local level. All right. Uh, what do you see as the next most important step MACAN could take to develop a comprehensive OA monitoring system? That sounds like a good question for Katie. <laughs> but I think that, um, you know, what we're doing here today is trying to, you know, get together more often in these, in these kind of um, forums so we can increase our collaboration and and you know, really sync these programs together. I think in the historically, a lot of the research we've done, you know, in the U.S. has been very um, fractured, you know, timelines and not communication, very little communication between partnerships and stuff like that. And I think in general, these kind of activities are really helpful. I think as we move forward, people recognize that it's more important to work together and and share resources and data and, and leverage resources against each other. And Katie, I think, you know, MACAN is a good example of a diverse group of stakeholders that are together with the purpose of bringing together these partners, such as the webinars, but also understanding what research um, is being done out there, what kind of collaborations are out there, so we don't get duplicative in what we're trying to do, uh, and therefore the, the resources are allocated um, to, get, to get the most out of, you know, those dollars that are available, so... It's good to hear that come from both of you. I think that's certainly the aim of MACAN to a large extent. And um, since I have this opportunity, I will put a plug in here for the MACAN workshop happening in May. Th this is going to be a, a significant question that we begin to really dive into and tackle uh, at that workshop. So, you know, folks like David and AJ and others on this on this webinar who are interested in that that question about how do we create a comprehensive OA monitoring system and what does it look like in the mid-Atlantic, um, please do consider uh, joining us on May 9th at that workshop. And again, logistics and more information will be coming out about that soon. Um, and, and Grace, I mean, you're, you're welcome to chime in. I know you're muted, but if you're interested, please do chime in on that. Hi, I will say that... Um I know Mara Coos is always looking to get involved and um, we're trying to get funding to build an infra infrastructure for the for ocean acidification data um, to go into the Mara Coos oceans map. Um, so that's an effort we've been trying to do so if people want to you know have the ability to put their OA data um, up somewhere where it's open to the public. Um, we're trying to get that going. Um, and the other effort that Katie and I are working on is building a static map. I know a lot of you have heard from us to get information about that. But we're trying to build a static, a static map showing the monitoring locations in the Mid-Atlantic. So, And that will go up on the website when it's complete. Um, and that's basically going to, we're trying to make the map interactive so that when you click on a location where there's OA monitoring occurring, you can get some more information about and link links to data so that you know when we do start talking about you know a monitoring plan um, for the region we can kind of see what's already going on and build off of that. All right, thanks Grace. 
Um, let's see, a couple more questions coming in. Uh, what's the best way to reach out to industry in other states to start the discussion on ocean acidification and potential monitoring partnerships like this one? Um, it, as far as, um, uh, you know, other states located on the East Coast or Mid-Atlantic, um, you know, they might be able to contact a state association. Um, in Virginia, there's the Shellfish Growers of Virginia or the Virginia Seafood Council. Those are members. They have members that are involved in shellfish culture or wild harvest um, of shellfish. So I would start there with state-run organizations. I agree, and I might add that you might also want to, you know, in addition to that, you might want to also talk to the extension agents um, and the extension program in your state as well, and they can help find those resources and, and organize meetings to start the discussion as well. Okay. Uh, have you observed any unusual shell morphology characteristics, such as curved back hinges, to be associated with water quality issues? Um, I can say at our hatchery we have observed those. Um, whether or not I can say it's correlated to specific um, carbonate chemistry, I don't. I don't really know. Um, but we've certainly seen that, and I've seen it uh, in other um, photographs of uh, larvae and shell abnormalities in developing larvae, Jagas and and Virginica. And looks like that's it. So with that, I'll say thank you to both of our presenters and thank you to everyone here today. And uh, keep your eyes out for the registration link for our next webinar on the 4th. Thanks so much, David and AJ. Appreciate it. Thank you all for attending. Thank okay, you. Thank you.